Welcome to the sports podcast that will put you in the zone all the time. Welcome to Pack Sports Zone with me, your host, Peter Pacman Clark. Hey, what's up, guys? We're here for another episode of Pack Sports Zone. We're going to be coming to you a lot more often over the next couple of weeks um, as we get closer to football season, as as we go through WrestleMania and wrestling, as we start the Premier League and soccer. And we'll later on in the show, we're going to have. Uh, our new soccer correspondent, Victor Salazar, the premier, the premier league yanker on with a quick interview to go over some things that's going over, which includes, uh, Lionel Messi as well as, uh, Jack, uh, Grilich going to Man City. Just a couple things on footy, footy for you. But let's start off with football. As last night, we had our first preseason game, the Hall of Fame game. Uh, obviously, uh, Peyton Manning will be inducted in the Hall of Fame. He's the headliner of the group, but, Football is back. We had our first game last night. The Cowboys and Steelers. Uh, Steelers end up winning the game. Um, game wasn't really much of anything to really know about. So the kick was just completely god awful. It was really horrible. Um, but uh, not really too much to see out of rest. Uh, out of most things, uh, obviously the starters were pretty much on the bench. Uh, although you did have Najee Harris uh, play for the Pittsburgh Steelers, both first round picks played for the for both teams. So you had the young guys playing, but in terms of veterans, you didn't really see any of them on the field. Uh, <clears throat> uh, obviously, this is only going to be the only game this week. Next week, all the other teams start playing as they start a new three-game preseason schedule. As this season, we are moving to 17 regular season games over 18 weeks. Uh, so adjust your fantasy leagues, uh, obviously, to have your playoffs in weeks 15, 16, 17. Not only because uh, it's changed in real life, but also there's a bye week in week 14. So you don't want to be that guy that start your playoffs in week 14 and have people on a bye. So... Do the right thing and start your leagues in week 15, having 15, 16, 17. And in terms of fantasy football, as well as real football too, but in terms of uh, fantasy football and maybe picking out some, obviously some sleepers, uh, the top people at each position, I'm going to go with my rundown of some of my tiers uh, in two weeks. Uh, actually, maybe in three weeks, right around August 26. I'm also at that time going to be picking out my real picks to win each division, my picks to win the Super Bowl. Everything, everything about that is going to be coming out right around the week of August 26, right around that dra- draft date. And if you're drafting before uh, that, that date, let's say you're drafting before the 23rd, you're probably doing it wrong because there's too many chances that a guy can get hurt during a game, during practice. If you're going to do, if you're going to have your draft, uh, two full, more than two weeks before the season opener. So don't draft that early. Have your draft probably August 28th, 29th, 30th, or even early September. I have a lot of drafts that's going to be in September. Do it for them because it's really going to be an issue if you take somebody in the first round. Big example, if you had Cam Akers and you took had your draft already early and he's gone. So Cam Akers I had projected as a very high pick. Probably even first round pick. I had him as a top 10 running back and now he's gone for the year. So you always try to draft as late as possible to avoid injuries like that. But if you are or locked into a draft that's going to draft before that uh, August 26th date, you can contact me on Twitter, uh, P-A-C-M-A-N 453323. And you can send me any questions on there and I'll answer you. Uh, moving on though to the NBA. Free agent hit this week, and it was a complete frenzy. Uh, obviously, everybody's going to talk about the Lakers because they traded to get Russell Westbrook. We don't know how the fit's going to be because he needs the ball in his hands. We obviously know LeBron needs the ball in his hands. And Westbrook will help them in terms of having them play faster because when he gets the ball, he's out. So he can definitely help him out that way. In terms of a slow-it-down game or when it gets to playoff time and things have to slow down, not sure how much he's going to help him. He may actually hurt them. But with Westbrook, they also signed back uh, Dwight Howard. They fought, signed Trevor Ariza. They have a much older team, but they do did also get some people that are a little bit younger. Kendrick Nunn from the Miami Heat was a good, really young player that they just chose not to resign. Uh, 
Also, you got Malik Monk, who's a good young scorer that hasn't really fulfilled his promise yet. So they have some people in there that, that are some young guys in there. So Lakers are obviously going to be tough as usual. Uh, obviously, the New York Knicks, that's going to be also a big name as they finally get the guy that they probably should have had four years ago as Kemba Walker is coming to New York. One thing I've been saying for years to all my New York New York Knicks fans is that New York basketball will return when you get a true point guard. You need somebody to have the ball, hit the game winner shot at the end and just get the crowd up. And Kemba's somebody who who can do that. As everybody remembers his moments uh, when he was at UConn hitting game winners in Massive Square Garden. So he knows how to do it, winning Big East champions on, championships on that court. He knows what to do in that court in MSG. So he should do them proud. I don't think he's done like some people are, th- are saying. He just had a bad year. He had an injury-filled year, but I don't think he's done. So he will be joining the Knicks as well as Evan Fournier. So he's a good good shooter, good solid overall player. They signed him to a solid contract of about nine I think it's I think it's nineteen and a half million per year. So those are two big additions to that team, a, a team that needs additions because as we saw, Randall was not ready to carry the load in the playoffs last year. I don't know if it's because he was tired. I don't know if it's because obviously the defense in the playoffs are different, but he was not near the same in the playoffs against the Atlanta Hawks as we saw him during the whole entire regular season. So with them now having a closer in Kemba, with them now getting another score in Fournier, they, they now have a chance to be more dynamic on offense. And and I think the Knicks will actually be a pretty good team. Another team that made the big runs, the Chicago Bulls, my Chicago Bulls. I've been a suffering Chicago Bulls fan pretty much since Jordan retired. They had a little a good spot when Rose, they drafted Rose, but obviously that didn't work out. They just made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. But they seem for the first time after finally getting rid of Gar Foreman and John Paxson, they seem to finally be turning it around as first they went out and signed Lonzo Ball. Now, anybody that knows me knows that I'm not a, the biggest Lonzo Ball fan. I do think he does fit what the Bulls need because he's a f- good defender. He's pretty much a 3 and D player because he can shoot the 3 and he's a good defender. Uh, he's very fast in, the, in transition, so if you get him the ball, that team could run, and you got some athletes on that team with Zach Levine and Patrick Williams, and now the other person that I was going to mention – DeMar DeRozan. DeMar DeRozan, the 31-year-old four-time All-Star for Toronto and San Antonio, joins the Chicago Bulls. Now, $27-28 million, that may have been a little bit much. However, he's going to have a good mentorship over over Zach Levine. He's going to have a good mentorship over the 19-year-old Patrick Williams. And he can still score. He scored 20 points per game last year. He shot 50% from the field. He he was able to throw in seven assists as he was a big time playmaker, pretty much running that offense, especially while DeJounte Murray was out at point guard for San Antonio. They're getting a big time player here. So will you add, and, and he's gonna be for three years. So it's not uh, I'll give you an example. Kyle Lowry, he's thirty five years old, about to turn thirty six, and he gets a three year deal for ninety million. You see Chris Paul He's already with 37, 38, and he's getting a four year deal. I think, actually, no, I think he's 37, maybe 30, but he's getting a four year deal and he's making 120 million. So when you look, look at it compared to that, and you're saying he's going to be 31 years old. So by the time his contract is done, he's 34. He's still young enough that he's younger than what Chris Paul and Kyle Lowry is right now. So I think it's a good deal for three years. You add those two, um, Alex Caruso, another guy they signed uh, for about $9 million a year. He looks like he's going to be pretty much the, the backup combo guard, uh, what they expected Kobe to be. But the big difference between him and Kobe is Alex Caruso plays defense. He plays with a lot of energy. Uh, he's a good team guy. Not saying that Kobe isn't. Kobe is also a very good team guy, but he's more offensive-minded. Uh, he's not really as good of a passer because he's just looking for a shot mostly. He's getting better at being a passer, but he still has a ways to go. So there's a lot that's still to go in Kobe's game. And he's only 21 years old, so I, I just don't know where the fit is for him right now. Uh, if I'm the Chicago Bulls, i probably trade him at this point because I can only see his value going lower as – the season goes on, and if Caruso, who they signed to a good contract, so he's not going to sit the bench, he's not going to play 18, 16 minutes a game. He's going to be playing, at worst, I would think, 24 minutes a game around that. So 
24, 25 minutes a game. So it really doesn't leave much time because Zach Levine plays 35 minutes a game. Uh, Lonzo Ball is going to be playing around 32 minutes a game. So at the both guard positions total, you got probably around 30 minutes of action. So if he's taking 23, 24, 25 minutes of it, you have nothing for Kobe White. And that isn't even counting. You drafted a, a combo guard in the second round of the draft. So there's not really much room for Kobe White. I, and as I said, the value is going to go down the less he plays. So I would suggest trading him right now. Uh, at backup shooting guard, you also have Tony Brown Jr. who can also play there. He plays both shooting guard and small forward. And then... Like I said, Pat Williams can also play small forward. He's probably going to start out at power forward unless they make another trade as they're waiting to see what goes on with Larry Marketing. And that'll be probably their last move or their last significant move that they'll do this offseason. But the Bulls are making a lot of changes. I think they have a legitimate chance to be the number four seed in the East. Uh, but we'll see what happens. And it's going to be a it, – listen, it's only been a couple of days, like three days of free agency, so there's still a lot of time to go. Today is the first day that actually people could sign offer sheets restricted free agents. So this still it's still going to go through the weekend of a lot of things that's going to happen. So by the time I have the show next week, there's, be a, there's going to be a lot of changes. Moving on to baseball, though, just let me get this out of the way. The Atlanta Braves are over 500. That's that's it. That's all I really got to say. It, well, no, it's not, that's not all I got to say. But after 109 games – for the first time this year, the Atlanta Braves are over 500. That is how bad they have played this year, that they finally get over 500. And what's worse is that they are only a game and a half out of first place as the Mets have completely, I was, I'm not going to say completely. I'm going to say almost completely because they're still up, but completely blown their opportunity to stretch this lead. I mean, you're talking about a team that, I understand now DeGrom's out. DeGrom has played most, pitched most of the year. Um, you've had Lindor for most of the year. He's been out the past couple of weeks and he may be out for a few more weeks, obviously. Uh, you traded for Javi Baez. Alonzo's been playing pretty much the whole year. Conforto's been back recently. He's been playing well. So you have all these pieces there and right now you're, you're in a load of trouble because even though the Braves will still go the rest of the year and some of next year without Ronald Acuna, they're, they're, top all young player all everything player they made a lot of moves at the at the deadline now i would say the biggest move is they helped out the bullpen by getting the pittsburgh pittsburgh closer uh they obviously went out and got a bunch of outfielders whether it's horace salar uh, adam duvall back they already had gotten peterson a couple weeks before that so they went and got a lot of pieces that obviously you can't replace ronald acuna but they had a lot of dead spots in their lineup. And now with Travis Darnold about to come off the list, possibly as early as Sunday, you're going to have pretty much the whole Braves lineup um, be a menace, to be honest. There's going to be no weak spots in that lineup because Peterson has been playing great against lefties and righties. So if you have Peterson in the lineup, you got Duvall in the lineup. Uh, and Heredia, he hasn't been playing as great lately, but let's say he's out and you still also have Solar in the lineup, who's a power bat. And Riley's been one of their MVPs this year. Freeman is Freeman. Since his cold start, he's been hitting like 350. Uh, Ozzy was made the all-star team. He's been playing well. And Swanson has over 20 home runs. So you count all those situations, and then you look and see on the horizon, Ian Anderson started last night in a rehab. That's their number two starter right now, or number three starter. And and also, and Oscar uh, Wino is also coming back, and he's gonna his guy who's probably gonna be their fifth starter. And he was pitching really well before he got hurt, and they just got they got loads of talent still in that organization. That I still don't think they can win a World Series because Acuna was such a big loss, but they can win this division again. As crazy as it seems, with their ace out Soroka, with their one of their top players in Acuna, one of the best young players in the game. And 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 obviously we haven't even mentioned about Marcel Ozuna who's out for the year because of all the domestic issue that he's gone through and being arrested. So that's three monstrous players in your team, and there's still a game and a half because the Mets haven't taken advantage. So that's going to be a crazy situation, and I'll talk about that in a second in terms of I think the Mets are going to hold on. But I want to go through each division really quick and see. Who's in first and who's going to, and do I think they're going to hold on to first or do I think they're going to die at the end? So AL East, you got the Rays in first place. They're up by a game and a half over the Red Sox and five and a half games over the New York Yankees. 
I, I, the Yankees have been so hot recently, eight and two over their last 10. I just think that by the time we're done, we got about 50 games to go in the season. I think they're going to find a way to catch them. They're just in a zone right now. The Yankees have always been a regular season team and the playoffs. We'll see if anything's different, but I think that they're going to continue this hot run and I'm going to have the third place Yankees to win the AL East and get past the Rays. Now, obviously the Rays have owned them when they played against each other. So that's the ultimate way to stop the Yankees from coming back. But we will see next time they play if it's a different story because adding Anthony Rizzo, who's a good contact hitter, was a huge boost to that lineup. And obviously, with the amount of power that you added to that lineup and just at the deadline, you and, and especially their left-handed hitters, you can – Pepper that right that um, right center right center field porch, and it's just made for left handed hitters. So it's just a lot of it's going to be a lot of offense in New York, and I don't know if the, if the Rays will be able to hold on. Uh, AL Central, you got the White Sox up by nine and a half over the Indians. I picked the White Sox to win win the AL, so I, th- I obviously think they're going to hold on to that division. In the West, the Astros are up by four games over the Athletics. I think the Athletics will keep it close, but I think the Astros will end up winning that division. Uh, in the NL West, now, right now you have the Dodgers four games back of the Giants, and you have the Padres seven and a half games back. The Dodgers are just so stacked, it's very hard to think they can't make up four games in 50. Uh, so even though the Giants I do think are real, I do think the Giants will make the playoffs, I don't think they'll die down the stretch. I just can see the... the the Dodgers going on a really hot stretch. They have everything you can possibly want, and, and I just think the Dodgers will f- find a way to do that. Um, moving on to the NL Central, I think the Milwaukee Brewers are up by seven right now. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I like the Reds, and, and I think the Reds have a chance to catch them. They're going to make this close. This is going to be a set. I don't think this division is going to be a blowout, but I do think that the Brewers will slightly hold on. But like I said, I, I would not be surprised if the Reds catch them. And in the NL East, the Mets right now up by half a game over the Phillies, over a game and a half by the, over the Braves. I just have to say, unless the Grom comes back fast, without the Grom, without Lindor coming back anytime soon, I just think, and, and Javi Baez, even though he's played well since coming to the Mets, then he had an 0 for 5 with 5 strikeouts. Like, it was either last night or two nights ago. I just don't think that they are that team that's going to end the season well. The Mets have never ended the season well recently, and I just don't see how they're going to do it. So I'm actually going to say the Braves will find a way to win the division and um, make the playoffs again. Uh, unbelievably, as bad as they've played and as, as long as they've been under 500 this year, I think they're starting to play well on the right at the right time. They finished a, a sweep of the St. Louis Cardinals, and I think that especially with the Mets schedule, if you look at the Mets schedule, it's ridiculous. I mean, the next thirteen, they have a thirteen game stretch starting next weekend where they play the Giants and the Dodgers for thirteen straight games. So, <laughs> good luck with that. You're playing two teams that are twenty games over five hundred and fighting for that first place out west, and you're gonna have to play them for thirteen straight games. So. I just don't know if the Mets can hold on. I, I would say this. If they can hold on after that 13-game stretch, then then I would give more credence to them holding on. But right now, it's really tough to see them holding on to that lead when I know that their schedule that they have to come out with coming up next for the next couple of weeks. But earlier today, I had a good talk, soccer talk, footy talk, with my good friend Victor Salazar, and we talked a little bit about everything in the soccer league. So I just want to play that interview for you real quick, and we'll be right back in one second. And we are here with the Premier League yanker, Victor Salazar, a.k.a. Big Matic on Twitter. Welcome to the show. Hey, what's going on? He's Vic is going to be our soccer correspondent on Pack Sports Zone, and he's also the special person that I picked as the first guest to have on this show, so... Welcome to the show, Vic. Pleasure, pleasure. Uh, hi, my guy. Uh, always uh, here to support you and, uh, you know, kind of do my due diligence because uh, i got to use all your fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that fantasy football show would have been a couple of weeks, but we want to talk about some footy action. Like, now, obviously, whether you're a footy fan, I've only been watching that for the past year or so. You've been watching it for years. The big story now is... Lionel Messi is not going back to Barcelona. First, I have to ask, how does something like this happen? How does a big team like Barcelona lose somebody like Messi? 
Um, I mean, there's a couple things you can look at. Man. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't think it was going to happen, but this has all like the resemble the rumblings and the resemblance of the fallout from the Super League that happened, mm-hmm. uh, the failed Super League that happened a few months ago. Mm-hmm. But basically, what it comes down to is La Liga, uh, which is the Spanish Premier League. Well, it's called La Liga, it's a Spanish uh, top flight football league. Mm-hmm. Essentially, is trying to guarantee that Barcelona or Real Madrid do not leave to go to the Super League, essentially. Mm-hmm. So what they're doing in the process is handcuffing both teams in regards to the salary cap that probably never, I mean, it, it exists, you know, it's called the Fair Play game. Mm-hmm. It's called Football Fair Play, which Man City was accused of a couple of years ago and somehow got off. So it does exist, but it's never usually been enforced. And now what's going on is they're saying, well, you can't get Messi deal done because you're going to go over this certain number. And that will cause a trigger into this uh, football fair play where it's kind of like a salary cap that we have here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So it's never been used before. The only reason it's kind of coming into play now is because of what happened with Barcelona uh, and Madrid trying to leave for uh, the Super League, mm-hmm. which... Madrid, the, the, the president of Madrid is still holding out hope for it for whatever reason. Um, the Italian teams haven't backed out either. The only six teams that are backed out were the, the Premier League teams. Mm-hmm. So essentially, this is kind of like a penalty that they're giving uh, Barcelona. And now, in turn, Barcelona is like, all right, well, you don't give us the money. Messi's going to walk. We just You just signed a deal with ESPN. You're just about to... Sell, sell 10% of La Liga to this big uh, hedge group. You think they want a piece of La Liga now with no Messi? You know, what star do they have now? Yeah. I mean, Sergio Ramos, uh, who was Madrid's captain for over a decade, Spain's captain for over a decade, he used to play in Madrid and he walked to PSG. Wow. So the faces of your league, you know, Ronaldo's been gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sergio- on, and now you lose essentially probably the, you know what many people call him the greatest footballer of all time you know so how does La Liga look in all this so it could be posturing you know even though PSG has reached out to Messi but that's how Barcelona lost Messi basically La Liga instituted that you know you can't sign Messi you can't give him what he wants and it's kind of like a penalty to Barcelona and Madrid for to leave La Liga so now what happens we'll see if Messi does leave or if La Liga says you know what Barcelona you know, we're getting pressure from ESPN. We're getting pressure from the hedge fund. You, you can sign Messi. Sign do whatever he wants. If he wants fifty million, fine. If he wants ninety million, fine. Because Messi was making close to like ninety million last year. Wow. Unheard of. How much he makes a year? Wow. So, so the thing about it, you say that he he may possibly leave, and you mentioned PSG before. Uh, where do you think he goes? Do you think if he does go there, ends up being PSG? I think he does go to PSG if this ends up falling through. You know, I'm right. Still not definite. I, I still think there's like some posturing going on right now. Uh, but I think he ends up a PSG is just, lo- just logical because Sergio Ramos has always wanted to play with Messi. Messi would never mm-hmm. play with Sergio Ramos on Madrid. He would never do that to Barcelona, go to their rival. His, uh, one of his closest friends is Neymar. And Neymar and, and Messi, I, I, I know we saw the, uh, the Copa America final together and you saw how Neymar was crying and Messi was consoling him. Yeah. Basically, like, you know, before Messi got to raise the cup, he's been someone like his friend, which I think would be where he would go. I don't think Man City had, I mean, I, I can't say Man City doesn't have money. I mean, they, they, they have money mm-hmm. forever. But it just seems like he would be a better fit there because his best friend's there, kind of his best friend. Uh, they have an Argentine manager, even though Pep is his old manager for Barcelona. And it's an easier league than the Premier League, obviously. There's only like three or three good teams: Monaco, uh, uh, I think it's Monaco, uh, Lyon, uh, maybe one other team, and then it's PSG. Obviously, PSG is the face; it's the team of that that league. Yeah. So it's easier. You don't have to play against you know the, the Uniteds, the Spurs, the Chelseas of the world. Even you know even in the Premier League, you know the the lower the lower team are just you know any any match in it. Anything can happen currently. Like I, I, I'm telling you, any match, anything can happen. So it's just it's a rougher league, and essentially he'll be playing with his best friend or one of his best friends, Juarez Barrow, 
are also known to be his best friend. But it just makes more sense for him to go there. And essentially, PSG is looking to finally win a Champions League. Why not do it with a front three of Neymar, uh, Mbappe, and Messi? And that was going to be my next question. Do you think that getting him would make them the favorites to win the Champions League? It's hard to say, man. It's hard to say. The Champions League is definitely the toughest thing to win in uh, European football because you're you're managing your team for its regular uh, league games, league cup games, and then you have to play the best teams in Europe afterwards. So it's it's what is a year round sport, man. Like, yeah. like people don't know, it's like they, they, you don't really have much of a time off. You might have. Summer's off, maybe. You might have maybe June, July off, and then right back to it in August. You know, Premier League and La Liga start next week. Like, yeah. we're getting right back into it. Uh, but I would think, I would think if Messi goes there, I, I would say they'd be top three. And I know people are going to kill me for this, but somehow Chelsea lands Lukaku in all mm-hmm. this. I don't see why the defending chance wouldn't be favored. Yeah. Because uh, Thomas Tuchel, the, they're the manager has been excellent. They are, you know, very defensive-minded team, but they have things up front where had they had a better striker, I know they signed Timo Werner from uh, Leipzig last year. Had he scored, like, half the chances that he probably missed, maybe that's a Lukaku type or Erling uh, Haaland, who I don't think they're going to get this year, but yeah. they get Lukaku in place of Timo Werner, who missed a ton of chances, a ton of chances in the Premier League. They would have been fighting for the Premier League title. They would have been fighting. You know, they won the Champions League. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? They, they probably could have been there for all three of the major trophies won well, in, the, in the Premier League is four. But they would have been there every step of the way. They just didn't have that striker up front. Uh, and then their manager, they switched managers in the middle of the year. Uh, club legend uh, Frank Lampard did not kind of like, to an experience, he didn't know kind of where position his players. Then Thomas Tuchel came in and just changed that whole thing around. And look, they finished in the top four. They made a cup final, and then they won the uh, they won the, the Champions League. So I would put PSG, Chelsea, and of course, you know, City. City has to be there, even though, even though you know they never end up winning. And then Bayern. Bayern's always going to be there. Man. Bayern's just you know those those are my top four. If you're going to make Ah, uh, so who should win the, the uh, Champions League next year? It'll be the, one of those. Wow. Well, and and it's, it's unbelievable that you just have those great teams, and Premier League is such a fun league to watch. And they've also made an addition with Grealish, with Jack Grealish going from Aston Villa to Man City. How, well, how do you think that works out? Yeah, I'm going to probably do this on my podcast. You can't ever trust uh, anything that Pep Guardiola says. <laughs> Pep Guardiola was saying that we're not going to spend money this summer transfer window, you know, this and this and that. They sell, uh, they let Aguero go for free. I think they let uh, another defender go for free to Barcelona. So, essentially, I think his name is Eric Garcia. I think he went to Barcelona for free. Essentially, they didn't get any return for the players they let go and are spending $100 million on Jack Grealish. Yeah. Still trying to get Harry Kane. You know, Tottenham wants 150 million pounds for Harry Kane. They're not going to budge from that. And now that Messi is available, I wouldn't put a past pet to spend on. I mean, you don't even have to, for Messi, you don't even have to pay. You don't even have to buy Messi to come to your team. You just have to give him what he wants in his contract. The rumor is 50 million because he was making close to 90 at Barcelona. So at Barcelona, in order for him to stay, he cut his wages in half. So he's making anywhere, you know, he probably wants anywhere from 40 to 50 a year mm-hmm. as a full $90 million deal that you have with Barcelona. So I wouldn't pass that to, to try to go after Messi. And Jack Grealish, man, uh, I have a, I don't think he's one of the best 10 players in the Premier League, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I think he's very, very good. But I would definitely put at least eight guys ahead of Jack Grealish. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he is a really good player and Pep is one of the best managers uh, in the world, probably one of the best managers of all time. You know, w- without Pep, who knows how good Messi is? You know, M- Messi and Pep, and that midfield, that that Barcelona team that won the treble twice, like that that that's all Pep right there. Um, so, Man City again, they're spending money. They're always going to spend money. They have a rich, you know, billionaire, trillionaire, oil fucking owner who just. 
just spends when he wants to win. Like, he, I can't be mad if people want to win. And, yeah. and you know how they say this in American sports, you buy championships? <laughs> you buy champ, you In European football, you buy championships. You can't win championships for the most part without the best players. You know how you get the best players? You have to buy them. Yeah. That being said, I think Jack Grealish is going to fit well there. Did they overpay for Jack Grealish? Yeah, Aston Villa really made a good deal. You know, $100 million for Jack Grealish. I mean, United was trying to get him last year for like 85. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 even then, I think he's too much for 85 million because, I, like I guess I don't think he's one of the top 10 players in the Premier League. He might be top 10, maybe 11, but there's certainly guys on for that. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, Erling Haaland and how he's probably not going to get transferred this year, most likely next year. Uh, now, with Chelsea, if they do get somebody like Lukaku. Do you think that takes them out of the Holland um, sweepstakes? And if it does, who do you think it'll go to? That's the thing, right? Like I told you, with Chelsea and Man City, they have owners that are... Uh, obviously, all the owners in the Premier League, if you own a big six club in the Premier League, you have money. Yeah. Willing to spend that money, right? Chelsea, Chelsea and Man City, of all the teams, are willing to spend that money. If you look at the other teams... Arsenal is owned by uh, Stan Kroenke, so the LA Rams owner. Mm-hmm. United owned by John Henry, the Boston Red Sox owner. Mm-hmm. And, and, no, I'm sorry. Who did I say? United. You, yeah. United owned by the uh, Tampa Bay Bucks owner. I forget his name. Um, and Liverpool is owned by John Henry. So those three guys, they're very wealthy, but they look at these three teams that they invested in as an investment. Mm-hmm. So not all gun home, even though United... Uh, United went and got Jadon Sancho, and you know Arsenal spending money, Liverpool kind of spending money, but you don't hear about much more than you don't hear much more about them spending money in, in transfer windows anymore because they have American owners. And that's one that's been one of the big things that the, the, the English hate about the American owners that they see this as an investment. They don't see this Business. as as wanting to win. You know, we bought the club to make money off the club. Yeah. You know. So, you can never rule out Chelsea when it comes to signing a player. You just can't. Even if they sign Lukaku this year, they spent $60 million on Timo Werner last year. <laughs> and we thought that they solved their striker problem. But we saw what Timo Werner did this year, or last year, and it wasn't up to par. And look, now they're going to spend double that to try to get Lukaku. So, if they get Lukaku, I would have ruled them out of getting Erwin Haaland. But I think if Chelsea gets Lukaku, I definitely think Haaland, unless Man City comes in and just destroys everyone with their bid, he'll end up in Spain with either Barcelona or Real Madrid. Right, so, with all this said, who is your pick to win the Premier League this year? As it starts next week anyway. It starts next Friday, I think. Oh, Who's man. Your pick? I, I got a lot of heat last year for picking this team. <laughs> I'm going to go with them again. Uh, I, I, man, as an Arsenal supporter, it hurts me to say this one more time, but I think Chelsea, Chelsea, if they get Lukaku, should be the best team in the Premier League. They should be the best team in the Premier League. Um, we got to see how, you know, because Lukaku's playing in the Premier League already. That's the thing, right? Mm-hmm. We never see, we, we don't know what Jay Sancho is, right? Even though Jay Sancho is a phenomenal talent, mm-hmm. he did it in Germany. It's a little bit different when you come to the Premier League and you got guys who are rougher trying to take your legs out. Like, the Premier League is the hardest place Hardest league to play in because of the style. Like, yeah, it's, it's not, explicit. When they took him out, it's when he first got off. Yeah, yeah, right. Coming from Germany, Pulisic did not have like a good start to the season just because you have to get adapted to the game. So, Jay Sancho is English. That's, he has that in his favor. So, he trained you know, a couple weeks with the English squad. A lot of those guys are on the Premier, our Premier League teams. So, he knows that style. So, you have to see how that happens. But Jay Sancho is what we think Jay Sancho is. I, I give United a good shot. Obviously, Man City would have a good shot. I don't see... I, I don't see Liverpool up there. Maybe they'll finish third or fourth, but I don't see them being for the title. Spurs, I mean, they're just as big of a mess as Arsenal's in. They, they, uh, Harry Kane, if Harry Kane doesn't come back, then I don't know what the hell is going to go on with Spurs. I don't see them as a threat. And Arsenal, man, listen, as big as Arsenal's a porter, I'm also a realist. If we finish fifth or fourth, I'll be happy, but we're not competing for the title. So essentially, it comes down to United, Chelsea, or Man City, and I just think... If Chelsea get that striker in Lukaku, I think Chelsea wins the league. 
But if not, I see City probably taking it back to back here. Now, before you go, I just want to ask you uh, regarding the American team. I want to say everybody knows Pulisic, Pulisic, but they don't know the other guys. Who are some of the guys on the American squad that you think are going to make a jump this year? How do you how do you think about them overall? As they've done pretty well over the past couple of months. Well, listen. Anytime you beat Mexico in two finals, you you come a long way. I don't care what you say, man. Whether it was Mexico's B, C, A team, it don't matter, right? Because two finals. The, the Nations League uh, title and the Gold Cup, U.S. won both. So that's how Mexico, they, if Mexico wasn't trying to win, even though I think they brought some of their players for the Gold Cup, uh, Irving, was, uh, Irving Lozano mm-hmm. plays in it. Uh, they, they call him a Chuki. He used to play in the Premier League. No, he didn't play. I forget where. I think, yeah, I think he did play in the Premier League, but then he went over to Italy. Um, no, he wasn't in the Premier League. I'm sorry. He was in some other European league. But he's a good striker. And they brought him, but he got hurt like the first game. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. We were, we were watching something Copa America. I think it was a final. And then yeah. the first play, like the first ten minutes, he got kneed in his head. He, you know, concussion, whole big thing. So they brought players this time. They may not have brought their best, but they brought players. Obviously, USA brought their B squad. And then in the Gold Cup, you know, whatever. He beat Mexico in two finals in the summer. That's big. Obviously, we know Pulisic. Obviously, we know Gio Reyna. I think Gio Reyna has probably the best shot to be the best player in the squad if he just starts converting the things that he does well. He's a great dribbler. He's a great passer. He has so many chances in that Nations League uh, tournament but he just didn't convert. And he's super young, man. He's still not, he's not even 19 now. I think he's turning 20 this year. Yeah. He might be turning 19 or 20. So he's still got a good amount of time and he's with, and he's with Dortmund. I'm sure at some point someone big is going to buy him because that's what Dortmund does. Makes Great players and then sell them off for big money. Um, I think uh, Sergino Des uh, from Barcelona is someone that people should watch out for to, to, to cover that back line. And then I, I, Way, I think uh, Way is a great player uh, in terms of his development. I think he's going to be an important player to the Team USA. And then your boy that plays in uh, Juventus. Uh, what's his name again? Your boy that plays in Juventus? With um. You're talking about from last year? McKinney, McKinney, yeah. McKinney. Oh, oh McKinney. yeah, Weston McKinney. Weston McKinney, yeah. I mean, there, there's talent there. Like, this is the first time we've had, in a long time, our best players playing in Europe. Listen, like I said, you play with MLS is fine. You know, if that's your starting block, but you can't have a team full of MLS players and expect to do anything. And we're seeing that now. You know, th- that was a team of MLS players in the Nations League against uh, Mexico, I don't think we would have come back from being, you know, goals down. I think U- U.S. was down one nothing and then 2 nothing again. Yeah. Like, I don't a team for MLS players would have been that resilient to come back and tie and then eventually win the tournament. You know, and you, you learn that from playing at Chelsea. You learn that from playing at Dortmund. You learn that from playing at Juventus. You learn that from playing just in Europe. Just because it's the competition is fierce, man. It's Literally ten months of football. Ten they, months, and they had a different they, type of attitude too. It's almost like they they felt the confidence that they felt they can win those games. Yeah, you know why they did feel that because they have been in those situations. You know, when you play at Dortmund and you, you play Bayern, you play Leipzig, and you're down one two nothing. Like the game's not over. Like it's they they play full ninety minutes. When you play at Chelsea and you're playing the cities and the United and the Liverpool in the world, every minute counts. And that's how Team USA played, at least in that Nations Cup final. Being down one nothing didn't deter them. Being down 2-1 didn't deter them. And then finally taking the lead and winning 3-2 on the pollution penalty kick. And even at the end, even at the end, the freaking backup goalie. It was 3-2. Yeah. Yeah, backup South Mexico. Like, who, like it, was, it was great. Like, it, I, I haven't been entertained by the U.S. team in a long time. And watching them, at least in the Nations League, was entertaining. I didn't get to see much of them in the Gold Cup. I saw that. Gold Cup final, they were fortunate not to be down two nothing for them to win one nothing. You know, just the icing on the cake. Yeah. Well, the Premier League Yanker podcast hosted by Victor Valzar. You can catch that on Apple as well as Spotify. Vic, when's that coming back to? Yeah, I think uh, the return next week, right before uh, 
Right before the Premier League starts. Right before next week, Friday. So that's great. We will hear from you again. Once again, this is Victor Zalz, our Matic, the Premier League Yanker. He'll be our soccer correspondent on Pack Sports Zone. Vic, thanks for being on with us. I got you. Hey, anytime, bro. And once again, thank you to Victor Zalazar for coming on the show to give us a little bit of soccer action from more of an expert than me, just being a, a casual fan at first, trying to get into it more. But uh, thank you, Vic. And he'll be on more often, especially as the Premier League goes along and starts next week, next Friday. Uh, just moving on before we end the show, a little bit of wrestling news. Uh, uh, just to go through the, the four Semi brands where you go AD, AW, Raw, SmackDown, NXT, uh, AW this past week, Cody Rose tried to fake a retirement after losing to Malachi Black. Um, but the big news obviously for this week is what everybody's talking about for August 20th. Um, big rumor that they have signed CM Punk and Daniel Bryan and August 20th is the, is a show in Chicago. And that is when everybody expects for that to be announced officially. Uh, so that's, that's, everybody's going to be watching that show. Uh, I just, of, of a regular show, cause I don't, that's not a pay per view on the 20th. They do have a pay per view coming up, but the one on the 20th, I think it's just a regular show. Everybody will be watching that to see if CM Punk shows up. And I can just imagine the pop from that crowd in Chicago. It'll be like uh, like no other. So uh, other than that, there was nothing much on AEW, but that was pretty much it. Um, Raw, uh, obviously, it's, we had Karrion Cross lose again to Keith. Uh, this time he lost to Keith Lee. Um, Charlotte dominated Nikki Ash, but then she lost at the end. Uh, Raw's just horrible right now. It really is. They, they need to do something to change something on Raw because it's just completely horrible. So that, that's something they really got to work with right now. Uh, SmackDown. Uh, Roman and the Usos continue to headline SmackDown. They pretty much everything. Um, it's just, oh, and one other thing about Raw, uh, Goldberg did, um, came back obviously again. Uh, that makes me pretty much want to throw up. Uh, just get him out of there. I mean, I understand the liking when old play people come back. Whether it's like, for example, John Cena. It was good. I was never a big Cena fan, but it was good to see him back because I know what he does. I know he, he, the people that he can bring in, the, how he go, interacts with the crowd, what he does, he does well. When you bring back somebody like Goldberg, a guy who used to do like three moves per match, it's just it's just annoying to me. It's like a waste of time. And you got people that are sitting on the bench at Raw and SmackDown, and you have old guys replacing them. You got a guy like Ricochet, who you might as well send him back to NXT because he was a star in NXT, and he's doing nothing on Raw, and he's sitting in the background while Goldberg's getting another chance at a title shot. It's just stupid. But uh, I digress and move on to NXT, which was pretty much all about Joe and Karrion Cross. They were chasing chasing each other as security was holding them back the whole time, and that, that's pretty much it. Wasn't too much stuff on on. NXT this week, but the big thing is from outside the ring. Adam Cole, one of the guys who I said will be the future, present and future of wrestling. Adam Cole's contract has run out with WWE. Uh, the big question now is, will he make the jump to AEW? In which, by the way, Britt Baker is his girl. I'm not sure if his girl, wife, fiance, I don't know, but he is with Britt Baker, who is the uh, champ AEW women's champ right now. So he's in a relationship with her. Will he go and join her in that organization or will he decide to stay with WWE? I personally hope he stays. I think he's a huge star. I think WWE is going to be willing to make him a huge star just because of that time a couple years ago where they brought him up. They had him beat Daniel Bryan clean and then he fought Steph Rollins on, on Raw in, in a great match. I just think that they, they can prepare him to where he is a star on the big level, unlike a lot of other people, like, for example, Cross, who they're just burying right now, a guy that went undefeated on NXT, and now he's lost like two, three matches on Raw out of his first three, four matches. So it's just horrible. It, they they got to just bring Cross back, let him stay in NXT because it's just not working. But with that said, it's been another good week. Uh, like I said, we'll be coming to you a lot more in the next couple of weeks. Uh, probably one show per week till we get to the start of the NFL season. So we'll see if uh, how, how we get a good start to the NFL season. We'll have a lot of guests on. Um, we'll be talking with people like Mark Melusis from WFAN. We'll be talking on uh, Troy Retnick from Denver Broncos, who covers the Denver Broncos. 
Um, we'll have Jeff Lloyd, who's a big part and covers the Cleveland Browns. Um, what, what Anton Staley, who covers everybody, seems like. He used to cover the Dolphins, covered the Carolina Panthers. He's all over the place. Um, we are, we're going to have a bunch of people on. We're even going to have a special correspondent for SummerSlam. So the, right before that wet week comes on, we'll have somebody on. I'll announce them at the time. But we got a lot of things to go through. I will catch you guys next week. Peace out.